Welcome to My Favorite Mystic, a podcast about the weird and wonderful world of mysticism. I'm your host, AJ Langley, and today I'm joined by Pavlina Kulagina. She's a PhD student at Humboldt University in Berlin, working on the reception of Latin hymns and sequences in medieval German literature. Pavlina, thank you for joining me. Hello, Amanda. Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me for this exciting opportunity to talk about my favorite mystic. So your favorite mystic is Margarita Ebner. Exactly. And I'm very excited to learn a little bit more about her. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about you. So how did you get involved in the study of mysticism? It's a long story, in fact. So I first studied in the Moscow State Lomonosov University, and getting in touch with mysticism was pretty much inescapable. <laughs> because in 2008, my supervisor discovered, among a lot of fragments of medieval German manuscripts, the earliest extant fragment of Magdalene of Magdeburg. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, 12 years ago, they discovered this fragment, which of course caused a sensation. And since then, everybody is obsessed with mysticism in the Moscow State Lomonosov University German department. And we had to read Mechtel of Magdeburg, of course. But when you are confronted with a text like this, when you're 19 or 20 and don't really know a lot about anything, <laughs> you find it terribly boring. You don't really see this tremendous complexity. You just see a very, very dry text about uh, some revelations and raptures and God and whatsoever. So I was confronted with mysticism very early, but it wasn't until much later that I really discovered it for myself and realized how fascinating it can be. So you're saying that you're a convert to mysticism? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So what are you working on right now? Uh, right now, I work on two big topics. So on the one hand, due to our project, I work on medieval German translations of Latin hymns, which sounds terribly boring, but can be very fascinating as well, because you actually see how people used Latin text to make them practical for their lay devotion. And on the other hand, I'm very interested in how mysticism is connected with liturgy and with the material culture, and how, in fact, imagination works, and how literally text function in the enclosure. So it's a very broad specter of topics. I really like the idea of using mysticism and mystical texts as a way of examining imagination. I've never really thought of it that way, but I think it's a really interesting use of these texts. Exactly. And you can see that in the monastery, there are so many techniques of not only controlling and restraining imagination, as we can imagine, but also stimulating it and making imagination very creative. And we can see mystical texts as products of this very complex process of stimulating imagination, in fact. Speaking of mystical texts, let's move on to the woman you are here to speak about. How did you come across Margarita and her texts? I was first interested in letters. So I wrote my bachelor thesis about medieval German private letters. And Margareta was a very prolific letter writer. We have a very big corpus of Heinrich of Nördlinge, who was her fan pal. So the letters Heinrich wrote to her, this is, as far as I remember, the earliest extant German correspondence. Is this corpus made up entirely of Heinrich's letters to Margarita, or do we have letters from her to him as well? So there are over 50 letters, but not of uh, her. We only have one letter which Margaret wrote herself. So how did we end up with his letters, but not hers? Did she keep them and preserve them somewhere, whereas I guess her letters just got lost? Well, maybe it's uh, because uh, he actually had a more turbulent life than her, so we had to go into exile because of a political conflict. And as a man who, who could move around more, so probably that's why uh, he lost her letters on the way. And his letters, they were found in the same manuscript as Margareta's own text, like as her revelations. Okay, so we're blaming the patriarchy for the loss of her letters to him. Absolutely. <laughs> So is she primarily known because of her connection to him? Exactly. And I think that Heinrich of Nerdlinger is one of the reasons why Margareta is not as widely known today as uh, she could be, because most of the research done on her is done in connection with Heinrich and with his letters. Maybe two-thirds of articles and books naming her actually write about Heinrich or their friendship and how it worked. 
Well, let's put an end to that overshadowing and move on to Margarita. So what do we know about her? In fact, a little bit, because not so much known about her. Margarita was born in 1291 into a noble family. And at the age of 14, she got into the Kloster Mödingen, which is in South Germany. But at the same time, it didn't mean that she converted into close connection with God right away. In fact, she lived here for seven years until she got a mysterious illness, a very grave illness, sent to her by God. Does she know in the moment that the illness is caused by God? It's explained right away. So Margareta writes that it was sent to her by God and that prior to this illness, she was not attentive to herself. That's how she puts it. So she cannot even describe the first 20 years of her life because she was so oblivious. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't have this contact to God. Didn't have this contact to herself. So illness was actually sent by God to make her change her mind. That's fascinating, because with some mystics you find that their pre-conversion self is very worldly and very self-absorbed, whereas in Margarita's case it's the opposite. She wasn't paying any attention to herself before God's intervention. Pretty much, yes. At least her, her revelations and her autobiography starts rather abruptly with this description, so nothing existed prior to this. And how does she describe this illness? She describes it as a strange illness with a great unbearable pain, which gripped my heart so that I couldn't easily breathe. And it affected her eyes as well and her hands. And she had to spend 10 years bedridden. And even though after that, her health got a little bit better and she could walk again, it never actually let go. So she suffered tremendous pains from now and then all her life long. And it doesn't only describe how her physical health is affected, but also how her mental health is affected. So she suffers from depression, as we would call it today. And it's very interesting to read an account on depression from, you know, the first half of the 14th century. But yes, she has bad moods. She cannot communicate to anybody. She finds everybody annoying. She gets totally disconnected from her convent. And even though they take care of her like good friends, she cannot bear their talking about irrelevant stuff. (laughs) It doesn't have anything to do with God, just like simple gossip. That kind of throwing shade at their community is very on brand for a medieval mystic. But what role does her community play in the text as a whole? Margareta has complicated and turbulent relationship with her community. On the one hand, they often annoy her and she often feels alienated from them. She always feels pretty lonely. For example, right in the beginning, she states that while my illness struck me, I realized that a lot of people told me that they can't be close to me anymore because they can't look at my illness, which is which sounds very sad. I bet she was really disappointed with people at that point. At the same time, she has close friendships. And when also somewhere in the beginning of the, of the text, one of her close friends dies, she mourns for a long time. At the same time, she really needs her community as a background for her revelations. So she often describes them using them. For example, uh, right in the beginning when, when she describes her illness, she says, not only that it was really difficult for me to breathe, but that my breath could be heard by other people from some distance. My breathing could be heard even from far away. So she always needs this outer perspective on her. Or when she describes her, an instance where she... Uh, has terrible pains while giving a mystical birth to Christ. She also needs to state that the nuns who are holding me could feel this movement in my stomach. So she always describes that she's heard and she's seen by her community and she's felt by her community. I think this is very important for her, in fact. Or in one instance, she needs to check whether she, whether her experiences are in fact mystical because when she's standing in the choir and praying, she can perceive a sweet odor, like a huge sweetness coming at her. And she asks her fellow nun whether she feels the same. And it becomes for her a clear sign that she is special. They just make her text way more believable and real. 
So what other kind of things does she talk about in the text? So she writes about herself. She's very confident about her very special gift. She pretty much models herself after holy women, or at least after women with a mystical gift. Any holy women in particular? So we know for sure that she read Mechtild of Magdeburg. A copy of her text was sent to her by Heinrich. And there are studies which showcase how her language and how her imagery were affected by Mechtild. And she generally mirrors the trends in spirituality of that time. So, for example, she also admires Bernard of Clairvaux, and she also admires poverty. So she shares some features with Franciscan spirituality, you could say. Okay, so those are her influences. Now let's talk a little bit more about the content of her work. So other than her prolonged illness and throwing shade at her sisters, what sorts of things does she talk about in her work? Her biography is very... At the first glance, it's very boring because it doesn't narrate much. I think this, this is one of the major reasons why she's not so widely read and why she's not so popular, because it's really tough to read her. You find yourself reading almost the same descriptions, which happen through the liturgical year, and you feel that the text doesn't move forward a lot. So there are very bright episodes uh, in her text. For, for example, she describes this episode where a pregnant woman is accused of stealing a host and this woman is like she's cut open the baby's taken out of her and she's burned at stake i think this is probably the episode which which is the most connected with something outside of the monastery and margareta is very concerned by this episode not because of the poor woman and her poor baby but because of the poor host so she's totally enraged. How could somebody do this to the body of Christ? And how could somebody dare? And she, she has to stay in bed because she can't cope with her emotions. And she's like, yeah, some people were sorry for, the, for this woman, but not me. But other than that, not so many things happen. And in course of the text, you can't even tell how old she is. Like she could be 30 or 40 or 50 and nothing really changes. And at the same time, when I read the text, I think for the third or the fourth time, I realized that there is a certain development in it. So while in the beginning of her revelations, she describes her so-called symptoms, how she cannot speak or how she's forced to speak or how she cannot eat or how she cannot even like smell the food. And further in the text, you see that she starts communicating with God more and more until she actually sees Christ as a baby or as an infant and starts lengthy conversation with him. So she talks to baby Christ. Uh, she talks a lot to baby Christ. She also talks to adult Christ, but uh, the conversations with the baby Christ are, I would say, the most intense and the most vivid. So they pretty much mark the high point of her spiritual development. So what kind of things does she talk to the Christ child about? Oh, this is very fascinating. In fact, I really wanted to talk about it because their acquaintance starts in a very touching way. She gets a statue of Christ in a cradle surrounded by angels as a present. And at night she sees how baby Christ comes to life and asks her to cuddle him Aww. because otherwise he can't fall asleep and doesn't let her fall asleep because he's turning and tossing in his bed. But anyways, she, she cuddles him, and this is how their friendship begins. And one of the best dialogues between them is when she gets to ask questions. And it's really striking from the modern point of view, because there you have uh, your god who can answer any of your questions. Like, why don't you ask something important? Like, where does the next pest come? <laughs> Or when will the world come to an end? Instead, she asks him extremely cute questions like about his relationship with Mary and what she felt towards him and how was his birth and like what his infant years looked like. But also, let me find this. I really want to read this text out loud. I desired to hear something about his birth. Then he responded and said to me, I was born in total purity and without pain, and my birth was as wondrous as the Holy Scriptures relate and also as the mother of Holy Christendom believes. He also said to me that he had suffered during the night because of the severe frost. I asked, my child, they say you were so poor. Is it true? He answered, it is true. This had to be fulfilled in me for the sake of the salvation of all. My child, is it also true that Joseph robbed you up in his pants? 
I have never liked that detail, he said. He wrapped me up in whatever was at hand. He had nothing more suitable for me. It's weird. It's really he, weird. So is she, it true that he wrapped you up in his pants? And he's like, yes, but I don't like that bit. Yes, like I have so many questions. Like, where did she get this information? Why does she find it so important? But it's interesting that she's asking the child Christ about being a child. She's only asking him things that a child would know. Like, you were just born. What was it like? Not tell me more about your life or ministry or the future or anything. It's just like, well, you're a baby. Tell me baby things. But I also think that it's very telling because she's so much in this moment and she wants to be totally present in this scene. So she needs to know all the details just to picture it in front of her in her eye. It sort of explains this need for weird details. I like that Christ really has a character here. The idea that she asks him a question. He's like, I don't like that bit. Yes, it happened, but I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, he always sounds annoyed, like... He only had his pants, okay? In comparison, what kind of conversations does she have with the adult Christ? Oh, it's pretty typical. It's about love. How much she wants to be reunited with him. So it's not very special, I would say. I really love this childhood part because the adult Christ talked to her about feelings and explains her stuff like, don't be afraid. I'm not taking away your senses. I'm giving your senses or I'm enlightening your senses. Stuff like this. Yeah, I find that her connection with the baby Christ is much more present, much more alive in a way. So she's clearly interested in the relationship between Christ and the Virgin Mary. But are there any other saints or holy figures that she has a particular affinity for? She really likes John because of his special connection to Christ. And in several instances, she recollects the scene where John is resting on Christ's breast and she clearly wants to be there instead of him. She clearly envies this very special and very physical connection. And of course, you think of um, all those statues so popular in Dominican convents where Christ hugs John and they're so tenderly lean toward, toward each other. So yes, I think John is Maybe not the favorite one, but she definitely thinks a lot about John. So if we know anything about Margarita, is that she loved to cuddle. She totally loved to cuddle, yes. And in fact, I really like this excerpt because it's not as well known as, for example, her scenes with the baby Christ, which, is, which are really striking, and not as well known as um, this episode with the poor host. But it's very telling, and it's very funny, and it's a bit weird. So I'm going to read this. Great. I was not able to eat. And indeed, I felt the greatest joy and grace so beyond all measure that I was not able to pray. Every cross I came upon, I kissed ardently and as frequently as possible. I pressed it forcefully against my heart constantly so that I often thought I couldn't separate myself from it and remain alive. Such great desire and such sweet power so penetrated my heart and all my members that I could not withdraw myself from the cross. Wherever I went, I had a cross with me. In addition, I possessed a little book in which there was a picture of the Lord on the cross. I showed it secretly against my bosom, open to the place, and wherever I went, I pressed it to my heart with great joy and with measureless grace. When I wanted to sleep, I took the picture of the crucified Lord in the little book and laid it under my face. Also, around my neck, I wore a cross that hung down to my heart. In addition, I took a large cross whenever possible and laid it over my heart. I clung to it while lying down until I fell asleep in great grace. We had a large crucifix and choir. I had the greatest desire to kiss it and to press it close to my heart like the others. But it was too high up for me and was too large in size. Only one sister knew about my desire. Otherwise, no one else. She did not want to help me because she feared it would be too much for my human frailty. Now our Lord is mild and good and cannot refuse our desires. What could not happen to me while awake, he granted to me one night while asleep. It seemed as if I were standing before the cross, filled with the desires that I usually had within me. As I stood before the image, my Lord Jesus Christ bent down from the cross and let me kiss his open heart, and gave me to drink of the blood flowing from his heart. 
I received much great powerful grace and sweetness, which continued in me for a long time. Whenever I said my paternoster, this grace was present to me again, as it had been before. My favorite part of that is, as she slept, she opened the book to the page and put it under her face. <laughs> Absolutely. So, on the one hand, she really needs to have this image with her all the time. And on the other hand, I, I just wondered whether you can read this as one of the forms of asceticism, because it's, I bet it's really inconvenient to sleep like this. <laughs> it's not straightforward sleep deprivation, but to definitely wake up with a headache. You'd have to. But also it sort of excuses, like she doesn't describe how she reads or how she meditates on the text or what wonderful prayer she found in the text or what revelation she had while reading. What really matters for her is this very tangible connection with the object containing the sacred text and the sacred pictures. So it's all about the image and the cuddling and the kissing and the Christ on a cross as a pillow and less about actual like deep meditation. Yes, and even the image is not just an image, but an image is only important when you can press it to yourself, to your heart. When, it, when you can feel something, when you can feel this pain while pressing it, and if you can hug it. Um, I like the idea that she wanted to kiss a really big cross, but the sister in the convent didn't want to help her because she was worried it would be too much for her. Not that it's a big cross and you're making a bit of a scene, but more just like, oh, you're old and frail. Don't climb up there. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's my favorite part of it. Uh, on the one hand, I could never really decipher what she means by my human frailty, because in the German text is just menscheid, like it's too much for her, maybe as a human, for her humanity. So she might mean that this is just too big and dangerous to climb on it, but she also might mean that it's just too much. Have some respect. <laughs> I think it's really ambiguous. Yeah. And I mean, I think that if it's the connection that she's getting from hugging these crosses, maybe like it's just a size comparison. The bigger the cross, the more overwhelming the devotion and her soul will just immediately ascend because she finally got to kiss the big cross. This is exactly what she means. So she describes this sequence of crosses which get bigger and bigger until there is the biggest one. Nothing is bigger than this crucifix, like this main crucifix. And when she doesn't get to hug it, she finally gets a revelation and she gets to kiss and hug Christ, at least in her dream. So her progression to increasing the intensity of her relationship with God is more about step by steps of size and physical objects and physical devotion, and less on betterment of herself and becoming more devout and is more like, I will get the big crucifix. <laughs> yes, a, a certain flair of competition. And it's, it's very ambitious, in fact, I really like it. But at the same time, I like that one of the reasons why Margaret is not so well known or maybe disregarded in the research literature is that she was always blamed as a hysteric, as somebody who is very naive and only sees this physical dimension of devotion and of religion. For example, this, there is this adorable book of Oscar Pfister who was in connection with Freud. And Oscar Pfister literally analyzes the revelations of Margaret Abner as a set of symptoms of a hysteric woman in clothes in the monastery where she can't have sex and can't have kids. And, you know, that's why we have this text. So it's a very, very precise medical description of a set of symptoms of a hysterical woman. And I think even though the book was written in the 20s, I think it shaped a lot the image of Margareta in the German literature, because up until recently, she was actually blamed as somebody who doesn't see this deeper spiritual dim dimension and stays on this physical level. So now we know that physical level is nothing bad, in fact, and Christian mat materiality is um, very important. But also in this particular episode, you see that this physicality is the way into a vision. All her encounters with bigger and bigger crucifixes lead her to a spiritual revelation in a dream. And that seems tied into her life overall. I mean, her initial interaction, I suppose, with Christ, her initial conversion comes through a very 
debilitating illness that ends up affecting the way she interacts physically with the world for the rest of her life. Absolutely. So it's it's always interconnected. And I think it's way more complicated than just staying on the physical level. So now we're coming to the main question of the podcast, which is why is Margarita your favorite mystic? In a way, she's my favorite mystic because it's the first mystic I felt very related to. So I think it was the first text after Mechtold of Magdeburg I actually read. And it was the first text where I felt like, wow, this is in fact very interesting. And this is a very humane text. And you can learn so much about the medieval mind and about the life in the monastery. And have all those beautiful little details like her conversations with Christ on, or her passion for crucifixes. On the other hand, after I read more about Margareta, I realized that there is a big gap in the research on her. And it's always very tempting to, to rediscover somebody, to say that like, okay, we have so much bad research on her, so much research which totally dis disrespects the text and totally oversees how beautiful this text is. And there is a chance to make this text visible and maybe to discover, yeah, interesting features about it you can, you can tell about. I love that. That's a, one, that's a great reason. And two, that's a noble goal is to bring these texts back into, if not public, then at least academic consciousness and make sure they're treated with the respect that they deserve, which I think a lot of mystics haven't been. And I'm excited every time I see somebody endeavoring to right that particular wrong. And maybe another thing I really like about her text is that it's so interconnected with the material culture and with the with the liturgy, because you can study liturgy by itself. You can read liturgical texts, but you never get to understand how they functioned unless you read an account on how they were read in the monastery. And with Margareta, on the one hand, she writes that she gets visions or she has revelations whenever she hears certain hymns, which is great because you see how immediately this works. And on the other hand, she writes that she, she sat in the choir and she heard some readings from the daily office and she couldn't hear about Christ being beaten up and humiliated, like she had to leave the choir. And this makes in turn the liturgical text so alive when you see how nuns actually reacted at them. In a way, it also teaches us how to read the text of Margareta, because she probably heard this story of Christ being beaten up and led to the cross millions, hundreds of times. And nevertheless, she finds it so emotionally intense that she cannot bear hearing it again at certain points. And I think that if we try to engage with Margareta's text, and we notice that this text is so repetitive and always goes in the circles of the liturgical year, we can try to read it as a medieval nun would read it. So we can read it in this medieval meditative way. We can try to see something new every time she repeats certain events and certain revelations. That's great. Well, Pavlina, thank you so much for joining me and for sharing your love of Margarita Ebner with me. Thank you, Amanda, so much for the invitation. It was a great joy to me. And thank you all for listening. Please join me in the next episode when I speak to Carolyn Music about the mystic Julian of Norwich. Mm -hmm.